Let me start with a short introduction as I combine working with national parks and also in the field with my former experience with the state administration with which I also cooperate still. Uh, this is something like a scheme of the, of the nature conservation as I see it. You can define it in many ways, but we have some uh, basic tools that we use. Uh, of course, uh, we talk about legislation. Often this is mentioned here, protected areas, but not only this. We are talking about management plans for species, etc. Land ownership, which is also very important. And now uh, Martin Nikolaj, he mentioned Romania as one of core countries for primary forests. There are a lot of NGOs or even private persons buying a land to protect primary forests. So this is another, let's say, tool that we can use. Financial tools like subsidies, voluntary based activities. And of course, we talk, if we talk about um, how it works in the field, we can talk about species protection, landscape conservation, of course, monitoring and evaluation, and of course, about accounting, which is something quite new. We all remember ecosystem uh, assessment, uh, accountings, or natural capitals. And somewhere in the center, what I see uh, as one as very important tools is protected areas. Why they are in the center? Because of a lot of pressures, not only from outside, from the developers and others, but also from nature conservation is just going directly to those areas. Why? Because they are quite successful, although we are still losing a biodiversity in general there. But we have more competencies there. You have a partner because we have administrations of protected areas there with managers and with others like national parks. So it's quite easy for species protection people and for others that are making monitoring or research activities, etc., to go firstly to protected areas. And this is not just because there is more nature. This is also because this is easier for us to communicate there what we want to do. Other, uh, if we compare it with the clean landscape, let's say. So the pressure is not going just, just from outside, but also inside of, the, of our silo. But what are the protected areas in Europe? Uh, this is something that is very heterogeneous. Uh, we have 130,000 sites in many hundreds of categories because each state uses each own categories and systems. The coverage is one quarter, which is not bad. So we have almost 26% of the EU and also the, pan yeah, and when we talk about EU, then we talk about 26%. If we talk about pan-European scale, this is a little bit less. Uh, if I show you the picture, uh, the heterogeneity is really very high because the highest, the biggest protected area in the world is in Greenland. It's one national park with one million square kilometers. But also we have in the same database, when we go to the Europe, memorable trees, small patches, something that is about 100 square meters. It's also designated as protected area. So as you can see, we talk about something that is really very diverse inside. And of course, there is a lot of uh, layers. We are not talking just about uh, nationally designated areas as we know them, national parks, protected landscapes, natural monuments, etc. But there are some international, especially in, in the European Union, we have 26 thousands of sites of Natura 2000, the largest network of protected areas globally that is designated under one legislation. And of course, we have treaties like Ramsar, Emerald, under the Bank Convention, etc. So you need to put all these on the map when talking about protected areas, not just nationally designated areas. Um, are there any standards that we can use and compare if the national park is the same kind of term in, in Czech Republic, in Slovakia, etc.? Yes, it should be so. Uh, there is guidelines for applying protected area management categories. So the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, developed and published uh, management categories. We have six. Uh, the sixth category, which is protected area with sustainable use of natural resources. This is something specific that you can find only in the north of Europe. This is like, imagine large areas where local communities like Sami people use the, uh, the, the area only in a very traditional way, like hunting uh, large carnivores, etc. Um, but less, uh, but other categories, category one from category one from category five, those are a typical example of those areas uh, that you can find in the European Union countries. The category one is mainly wilderness. We can talk also about primary forests. So those, habit those habitats or ecosystems or their parts that are not influenced by people, or you don't see this influence, this is not visible. But this is just a minority of what we can find here. 
And then if you go uh, to other, uh, sorry, yeah, if you go to others, uh, like for example, category three, four, five, those are predominantly managed. They need uh, to maintain, or there is a need for active conservation measures to, to maintain the biodiversity there. We talk about meadows, we talk about protected landscapes, when you combine um, cultural and natural heritage, uh, we can also talk about some national parks like the Krkonoš National Park in the Czech Republic, where you combine uh, a wilderness protection together with some meadows protections. So this is not so easy. The question is if it is used, and this is not used. I will, I will show you the example of, uh, of national parks. Uh, the good example that is in line with those guidelines is uh, Swiss National Park here on the picture. So at least three quarters of this is wilderness or something that, you, that is unmanaged and people don't go there if then only for recreational purposes, tourists. Then in Ireland, because they, they don't have such a big or high value of, bio, of, 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 uh, of original ecosystems, this is the Burren National Park. This is really designated as a, as, a, as a national park, but you can find flocks of sheep everywhere. So this is in fact something like a protected landscape. So, but for them, this is something that is one of the best places for the nature in Ireland. So that's why they designate it as a national park. And the last example is from Italy. Although you can find in Italy quite a lot of very nice mountainous national parks that are untouched, here you can see Cinque Terre National Park that is on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. And 90% of that national park is covered by vineyards still the national park. So I think when we talk about protected areas, when we talk about categories, uh, we need to be very clear where we are. And we need to be very uh, specific about one protected area the best. Um, so the result is that there is a vast majority of sites in the EU that are conserved or maintained and improved biodiversity. Uh, and a majority of those protected areas are um, uh, the biodiversity in Europe is so high because there is a long-term sustainable use of those areas in which you can find those high levels of biodiversity. I don't talk about, th I, this is not a hundred percent, but this is something that is really predominant, as I said. Uh, but of course, the nature conservation, uh, my shame that we are quite late, but I will try to be faster. We have also fashion waves in the nature conservation because we are also humans. So I remember that we had something like a protection wave. So we were more, let's say, um, inactive and we allowed more nature to be nature itself and to develop itself. And then of course we had some wave like the, the regular management or activities uh, that came uh, with subsidies from the European Union. And now what seems to me is that uh, the, the wave of rewilding or wilderness is coming back uh, a bit. And I see a bit of danger in it. Uh, why? Because now we have a EU Biodiversity Strategy 2030, you released last year, this is for 10 years. This is very ambitious paper, um, if fully implemented. The targets are, this is, there are some restoration targets, also when Hancha Frankova touched that issue, that there is a lot of, there is a need for a lot of restoration activities in Europe because biodiversity or the ecological um, status is quite low now. So we need to restore. And of course, uh, we talk also specifically about some um, fragile ecosystems like rivers. So there is a goal, for example, to restore 25,000 kilometers in, in, uh, into free flowing. But there is also another task that is linked directly to, to protected areas. To reach 30% of the coverage of the European Union by protected areas that are designated. It's worth to mention that this is the first time in this strategy when the European Commission uses protected areas as a tool. Before that, it was just Natura 2000, this international level. So now the states should think about uh, protected areas that are naturally designated as, as, as a part of the strategy. This is not a challenge, just 4% are missing. The challenge is that one third of those protected areas, which means 10% of the EU territory, should be under the strict protection. And now we are in a strict protection. What does it mean? The term, it hasn't been used before, never ever in the nature conservation. So there are two options. Uh, it can be, for example, the strict legal protection. Then okay, because we have a lot of paper parks, we have a lot of other areas that are maybe under the legal protection, but it doesn't work in the field. 
But there is also another option, strict protection against intervention. So non-intervention areas or let's say wilderness. And so wow, can you imagine that one, per one tenth percent of each country in 10 years, nine years in fact, in 2030 is unmanaged? So this is very ambitious. And if we talk about this, then of course we talk about to go back to protected areas that are already designated with long-term objectives that are to maintain or conserve the nature actively and to say now after 30 years we change this protection area protect, protected area objective and we stop any intervention there which means and this is a consequence also uh, I, I think David Stork uh, mentioned that we can lose the biodiversity there of course we will start protecting the natural uh, natural processes but in the European scale for us it, it's a potentially dangerous situation there are also new impacts, uh, and those impacts are the climate change and invasive alliance species. Uh, I will show you two examples. One example is from my home national park. This is Krkonosha National Park, where we have tundra, tundra ecosystem, which is a small patch in fact, but very, very valuable because this is the southest um, uh, existence of such a patch in the Europe. You can find others only in Abisko National Park in Sweden. So hundreds of kilometers, even not if, if thousands, not um, on the north. If we leave it to the nature, then it will be overgrown by, by pine, dwarf pine, um, because of the climate change, because of nitrogens, etc. Is it what we want to do, not to do anything, and then just to, 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 to watch the situation? Or do we want rather to, pro to, to protect this ecosystem, although actively, and to keep it as long as possible? I don't have an answer. I'm just showing what could be the consequence of the implementation of the strategy. The second example is also from the Czech Republic, the Podí National Park, and this is about invasive species. In fact, uh, recently this is the, the wildest, this is the wildest place, the wildest national park in the Czech Republic, almost three quarters are natural forests. But the problem is that in those oak or oak beach forests in the lowland, there is also some invasive species like acacia, locust tree. If you leave the nature to be nature in the national park, then in 20 years, the most probably in this natural forest, um, the locust tree will be the predominant species. Uh, what, the man what, the, what the national park is doing every year is that they go to the forests, even to first zones, and they cut those individual locust trees uh, just to keep the, 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 the biodiversity value and also the, the natural value of this forest um, in, 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 a, in a recent state. I know, yeah, I'm my shame. Um, so what to do? Um, of course, uh, what I see as a mistake is, or as, as, as a fault, uh, as a failure, uh, is that uh, the, the practitioners were not invited to co-draft the strategy, the, the biodiversity strategy 2030 since the beginning. Uh, so uh, the European Commission, the most probably um, at that ambitious goal, those 10% of non-intervention areas, to the biodiversity strategy because of some lobbyists. Not lobbyists from outside, but lobbyists from inside, like non-NGOs, uh, non-government organizations that are lobbying for wilderness, etc. Uh, and we should be resistant against this. Uh, we don't use scientific results. Science-based conservation should be here used because we have a lot of data, much more than 30 years ago. So we shouldn't be so general and say, 10% at the European scale. We should be much more focused on areas in which uh, it's really needed because we have a data for this. Emotions are always inside. If you want to catch the, the, the society to also help us to implement it and also to support us through politicians also, then emotions are inevitable, but they shouldn't be, this is it, uh, in this process. So this is my warning because if the strategy is implemented as such, then we will have in few years a big discussion if we don't lose biodiversity because of that. And I'm not against primary forest, I'm not against wilderness. I'm against just repeating mistakes like to say 10%. I will give you a, a, one example that I have is from Germany. In Germany, they are very developed in this and in their strategy for biodiversity, about 10 years ago, they wrote that they will leave 5% of Germany to the Mother Earth. They, they wrote it like that. 
till 2020, they were unsuccessful. And now we are talking about 10%. I can imagine three, four, five percent in the future, in the visible future, but hardly I can imagine 10%. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. I don't know if we have, for, if we have space for questions. Yeah, there is one. I expect it so. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, like inter interpreting uh, non-intervention as uh, potential uh, decrease in biodiversity is uh, not very um, correct, I would say. Uh, for example, only when you think about that uh, approximately 30% of uh, forest species are deadwood dependent species, then with increasing volumes of deadwood in the forest, we can lose these species and many of them are relisted or critically endangered. So I think uh, we should um, think in a more uh, like a complex way and about you know, which species are rare and endangered and not speak only about overall biodiversity. And um, I know it's, it's hard to imagine, like this 10% seems to be hard to imagine, and I think PODI is not a really good example of area to promote why the non-intervention is not good because that's area where we lost the natural disturbance regimes. Uh, but for example, in, in Slovakia, we have 18% of forests that uh, have protective function and for decades they were protected by foresters. And it was 18% of the forest um, that were really protected in long term previously. Uh, similarly, I saw some graphs from um, Alps. Uh, there are, I think, more than 10% of forests that are already now not uh, managed uh, just because they are too remote, for example. Then there are uh, countries like Romania that has uh, approximately, you know, 8 or 7% of this really like old growth forest plus another remote area. So I think it's all about the landscape planning and it's 10% is actually not that much because we then still have 90% of the, of the landscape that can be managed in different ways. And um, probably it could be solved that, for example, you know, more s urbanized countries like let's say Germany probably can pay for countries like Romania that, that can have larger protected areas. So, so um, yeah, so sorry, that was not a question <laughs> very yeah, much. But yeah, but I think, yeah, thank you very much for this often. because it shows that we are all experts on certain topics and uh, you are mainly about forests. And when we talk about forests, definitely non-intervention is one of the main approaches. What I'm talking about is that in the, at the European scale, especially the European Union scale, majority of protected areas are unforested. They are non-forest vegetation types that are dependent on some kind of activities. When we talk about rewilding, rewilding is definitely not non-intervention. Rewilding is a using natural processes to help us to restore the nature to a certain state that is cheaper than to just fully manage the place. And of course, when we talk about dead wood, uh, you can manage the forest, but you can leave the dead wood there anyway, because this is, this, is, this is my concern. We are very general about strict protection, but we should go deeper and say, okay, those kind of activities are allowed and those kind of activities are not allowed. And then everything is okay. What I miss is the definition of the term in, in, in the strategy. Any other question? If not, thank you very much. <laughs>